let's talk about some of the biggest risks that are um, facing your specific areas. Um, why don't we start with art? What is the biggest concern, the biggest risk to investing in art? So um, in terms of risks, I think the risks in art are pretty much the same no matter what the environment is. And the risk is as follows. If you want to sell an expensive piece of art right now, you will not be likely to get the exact price for it that you want to get. It's that simple. At the same time, so the segment of the art market that we focus on, by the way, so it's what we call blue chip artists whose paintings sell for one to $30 million. They're artists with names like Warhol and Basquiat. I can name a whole bunch more. Um, but it is one of those things where, you know, on the flip side, you can't help but think to yourself, what really is the risk inherent in something, let's say, like a Picasso? Like, would you really expect that tomorrow or a year from now or three years from now, you're going to wake up to find out that your Picasso is worth 50% less or worth nothing? That is not very likely to be the case. Obviously, you can't guarantee anything, but it just seems very unlikely. So the biggest risk in art is if you want to sell it right now, you will probably have a bit of a hard time selling it. That's the biggest risk. And what about life settlements? Yeah, I mean, Alan's doing my job for me up here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the life settlement market is, um, is very lumpy, and it's lumpy on a monthly basis. So um, in a closed-end strategy, uh, we're a little less concerned about the you know, quote-unquote liquidity premium, and I think it's important to touch on that because all of us up here have probably had investors you know, bring up liquidity premium as a reason to not invest in our strategy, and I think it's really, really overstated because every asset class has a liquidity premium when you want to go and try and sell it, right? I mean, generally speaking, you're not selling asset classes or assets uh, that are doing exceptionally well unless you're pairing them back. So you're not really selling them. You're just bringing them back a little bit. Um, but so anyway, you know, that that is the, the issue that we run into, and that's why we, we run um, closed-end strategies so that our investors kind of don't trip over themselves because of the valuation being updated, because the VBT tables got updated, or because of some existential, sh existential shock that really doesn't have an impact on the portfolio. Um, you know, there are some players in the space that have run open-ended strategies and really run into some trouble doing this because the mismatch between duration and you know, whatever your t liquidity terms can really foul you up. Um, but you know, really the, the thing that keeps us up at night is our underwriting risk, right? We are always asking the question, how can we underwrite a life better? How can we become more accurate in predicting life expectancy? Because the more accurate we are there, the less we're gonna pay for a policy up front, the less we're gonna pay to finance that policy over the life of it, you know, the hold period for us, and the better our uh, returns are gonna be for our investors. And in the credit universe? Well, we, we, what um, the founder of our firm likes to say, Clayton DiGiacinto, he likes to say that he doesn't really worry about our underwriting because we do it so well. Um, of course, that's what he's going to say. And, I, and, I, and, we, and, and we believe that it is what we do well. We analyze idiosyncratic risks well, especially in real estate and the other areas that we play. What keeps me up at night being the guy who manages the risk mitigation strategies um, is precisely what we are all reading about in the headlines. And it's something that um, actually took a little bit longer to occur than I thought it might. But the way I think about it is really we, we are witnessing a secular change rather than just a cyc cyclical one. And what I mean by that is we've had, uh, since Chairman Volcker hiked rates um, in the early 80s, um, subsequently to to cut them for 40 plus years. We have the end of a secular bond bull market, said differently, the end of falling interest rates to the zero bound. So zero interest rate policy took us to the netherworld, so to speak, and the netherworld in Europe in particular. And, and I do worry about all of the negatively yielding debt that is sitting at, on bank balance sheets in Europe, quite frankly. And there's a reason why uh, Madame Lagarde uh, started talking about emergency policies. I'm, sure, I'm certain you have a, a more well-informed view than I. But, but I worry about, from a more conceptual standpoint, 
I worry about this generational end of the bond bull market. And I think investors need to change the way they think about investing from, you know, um, everybody's smart uncle who wasn't so smart, but just because he was a baby boomer and he got in the market in the 1970s, he made a lot of money. I think those days, frankly, are likely in the rearview mirror. And I think the answer for some might be to move to a Warren Mosler-like world of MMT. Stephanie Kelton is better known for MMT than Warren Mosler, but he's the father of MMT. And I don't think that's a very good answer either because we can see to some extent, and it supply chain, we could have a long conversations on why we have inflation. It's very unusual and usually happens in times of war. But the point is, is that fiscal stimulus in the United States in particular did play a role. So we're a little bit, we're in a little bit of a policy quandary at the moment. What happens when we go into uh, the next recession? Uh, and frankly, I don't think the Fed is going to get to its terminal rate. Uh, I don't think it's going to be able to before the markets tighten financial conditions for it, not unlike what happened in 2018, if we remember what happened. Chairman Powell talked in a, confer a press conference in December and said, we're on autopilot relative to QT. Uh, the market said, no, no, you're not. Um, Equity sold off 20% with a much different and more robust backdrop than we have today. The yield curve inverted, the Fed cut, and we found ourselves back at the zero bound. So even if we get to 3% on Fed funds from here, which again, I don't think is likely, usually takes 5 to 7% worth of cuts to take us out of a recession. So I, that's what worries me most, is that we had a valuation bubble coming into this, and there's not a ton that policymakers can do relative to history that can, that can pull us out. So when it comes to asset allocation, what weighs on you the most? What is the biggest worry and risk that you see when it comes to you know, allocating the billions and billions of dollars that you're doing? Two things. The, one, the first one will be uh, the recession risk, which has increased markedly over the last few weeks. And here there is the risk that uh, the action of the central banks will be leading to a vast overshoot and that therefore it's going to accelerate the path to recession. A few weeks ago we were talking about soft landing. Uh, I think that this risk has receded and we're going towards something which may be a bit more brutal than that. Um, I'm not dealing with macroeconomics directly because I'm in quant equities, so I'm worried about the repercussions of this protracted scenario. What we do see in times of uncertainty as opposed to times of risk is typically factor reversal. In other words, things which we had seen work for 20 years or 15 years no longer work and we don't really have an historical perspective actually to test it. Or we think, oh, that's okay, in back tests we can live through that. We've seen this already since the beginning of the year with uh, value vastly outperforming growth, for instance. We've seen in certain factors with um, the intuition no longer working, i.e profitable, growish company getting pummeled. Uh, for me, that impacts the models, it impacts the factors, it impacts the signals, and ultimately it has a big impact on the performance. So this protracted scenario of upheaval worries me. 